Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. What they had not heard, they shall consider. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. For we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the, death at his, with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many. And he made intercession for the transgressors. So who, who was this prophet talking about? He's talking about himself, someone else, Israel, or the Messiah. There was an occasion actually in the New Testament when a man from Ethiopia was uh, traveling down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And we read about this in the book of Acts chapter 8, verse 28, 6. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down this from Jerusalem to Gaza, this is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, and was returning, and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scriptures which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus, or Yeshua, to him. So Philip said it was about Jesus. Um, If you'd ask this question to uh, some of the Jewish community around here, you'd come up with a different answer. According to a famous rabbi called Rashi, who wrote about 1050, uh, this prophet is actually talking about Israel, suffering on behalf of the Gentiles. And this is really the main interpretation of Isaiah 53 in the Jewish community today. Nevertheless, this is a view which was not so prevalent before this time. In fact, according to Arnold Fruchtenbaum, who's a Messianic Jew, a believer in Yeshua, he says every rabbi prior to Rashi reviewed this passage as describing the Messiah. When Rashi first proposed that this passage spoke about the nation of Israel, he sparked a fierce debate with his contemporaries. Most famous of these was Rambam, better known as Maimonides. Rambam stated very clearly that Rashi is completely wrong and going against the traditional Jewish viewpoint. Uh, Michael Brown, another Jewish believer, says virtually without exception, the earliest traditional, therefore the most authoritative Jewish sources, interpret Isaiah 53 with reference to an individual and in some cases with reference to the Messiah. 
Uh, one of the issues which uh, we need to address actually is where does this passage come in the scriptures? And if you look in the scriptures, you'll find that this is in the section of Isaiah, which really begins in chapter 40 and uh, continues through past Isaiah 53, uh, which is the prophecies which are actually dealing with the captivity of Israel in Babylon and the return from Babylon, their redemption from Babylon. And in the course of these uh, passages, Israel is actually at times referred to as the servant. And on the basis of this, uh, the rabbis would say that the servant right through is uh, as Israel, Therefore, Isaiah is also talking here in Isaiah 53 about Israel as the servant nation. And you can find there are scriptures which imply this. If you look, not imply this, actually say this. If you look at Isaiah 41, verse 8, um, it refers to Israel, and it refers to Israel as the servant of the Lord. Isaiah 41, verse 8. But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend, you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its furthest regions and said, you are my friend, I have chosen you and have not cast you away. So here it says that Israel is the servant. So does that mean that Israel is the servant right the way through this section of Isaiah? The servant is actually used 17 times uh, in Isaiah 50 through to 51, uh, sometimes with reference to the nation of Israel, but also sometimes with reference to a particular righteous individual within the nation who we would actually identify with the Messiah. Uh, Isaiah 49, verse 3, speaks about the servant, and clearly uh, he speaks about, you are my servant Israel in whom I am glorified, but then he goes on to speak about the servant as the one who would redeem Israel. In fact, in verse 6 it says, it's too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. So here it seems to be moving from Israel as the servant to a particular one who is described here as the servant of the Lord. In fact, if you look through Isaiah, you'll find that from the end of Isaiah 48 uh, and the beginning of 49 onwards, then the servant actually is now referring not to the whole nation of Israel, but to a particular individual who would be the servant of the servant, if you will, the one who would bring the redemption to Israel. And just as the passage is talking about Israel being in captivity and being redeemed from captivity, Isaiah is actually going beyond looking at the physical captivity of Israel to pointing out the spiritual captivity, the captivity of sin and redemption from sin through this particular servant, the one who would be the one referred to in Isaiah chapter 53. And you'll find that in there are Jewish interpretations which do relate Isaiah 53 to the servant uh, to the Messiah. I uh, mentioned here the Targums. Now the Targums are actually ancient paraphrases of the Bible which were written in the first century. There's a man called Jonathan ben Uziel who was the writer of these Targums. Uh, they paraphrase the Bible into Aramaic. Uh, they're not a literal translation uh, and so they actually do contain some of the writer's own opinion, if you like, his own views. But uh, in the Targum of Isaiah 52 verse 13, it clearly connects this passage to the Messiah when it says, Behold, my servant Messiah shall prosper. Look in the text of Isaiah 52 verse 12, it says, Behold, my servant shall prosper. So it moves from the servant as servant of Israel being here, the servant as the Messiah. Um, If you look in the Talmud, which is Jewish commentaries on the scriptures, you'll find they generally interpret uh, the Messiah Isaiah 53 is referring to a righteous individual or the Messiah. And various verses within this section are also referred to as relating to the Messiah. Uh, Now you have Jewish writings which are written during this time which uh, also speak about the Messiah uh, and relate it to Isaiah. This is a prayer which is written by a rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer Kalir, Uh, and it was incorporated into the afternoon service on the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, uh, written in around the 7th century. And he says here, Messiah, our righteousness is departed from us. Horror has seized us. We have none to justify us. He has borne the yoke of our iniquities and and our transgression and is wounded because of our transgression. He bears our sin upon his shoulder that he may find pardon for our iniquities. We shall be healed by his wound at the time the Eternal will create him, the Messiah as a new creature. Oh, bring him up from the circle of the earth, raise him up from Seir to assemble us the second time on Mount Lebanon 
by the hand of Yinom. So this actually remarkably, you can see it quotes from parts of Isaiah 53. It refers it to the Messiah. It says the Messiah has departed from us. He has borne the yoke of our iniquities. For our transgression he is wounded because of our transgression. Uh, And we may find pardon for our iniquities through him. Uh, So here's a Jewish writing. He's not saying it's Jesus, but he's saying that this refers to the Messiah, the Messiah who would bear our iniquities. Also, it actually says at the end of the passage there, you may wonder what the uh, bit about the hand of Yinon is. Uh, Yinon is actually a, a name which is given to the Messiah. So he's actually looking here for a time when he will assemble us the second time by the hand of Yinon. Uh, so he's even looking forward to a second appearance of the Messiah uh, when he will assemble us together. We have some other rabbis here. This is a rabbi called Marai Moshe Kohen Ibn Crispin. He wrote in about 1350 about Isaiah 53, and he was actually disagreeing with Rashi about it being concerning the uh, Isaiah 53 being about Israel. Uh, he says, I shall be freed from the forced and far-fetched interpretations of which others have been guilty. This prophecy was delivered by Isaiah at the divine command for the purpose of making known to us something about the nature of the future Messiah who is to come and deliver Israel. Rabbi Elshech, another rabbi writing in about 1550, says, Our rabbis with one voice accept and confirm the opinion that the prophet is speaking of the King Messiah, and we shall ourselves also adhere to the same view. Another rabbi, Rabbi Elia Davidus, wrote in about 1575 that not only is Isaiah 53 about the Messiah, but that those who refuse to believe this must suffer for their sins themselves. Uh, He wrote, but he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the meaning of which is that since the Messiah bears our iniquities, which produce the effect of his being bruised, it follows that whoso will not admit that Messiah thus suffers for our iniquities must endure and suffer for them himself. So these are some interesting comments from rabbis, and they're pointing to the uh, Isaiah 53 being about the Messiah. And even the Messiah suffered for our iniquities, and if we don't believe in the Messiah, then we have to suffer for our iniquities ourselves. Um, Now, none of these Messiahs are saying that uh, it's about Jesus, but they are saying that Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah suffering for sin, not about Israel suffering on behalf of the Gentiles. They're not saying it's about Jesus, but they are acknowledging that uh, Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah, about a suffering Messiah, Uh, who's known in uh, other Jewish writings as Mashiach ben Yosef, Messiah son of Joseph. Uh, And according to this view, actually, there are two Messiahs. There's one called Messiah ben Yosef, a suffering Messiah, who suffers and dies before being exalted, uh, as Joseph was uh, humiliated and brought low at the hands of his brothers in the book of Genesis and was made a slave and imprisoned before being exalted uh, in the court of Pharaoh. Uh, The other Messiah is called Messiah ben David, who reigns as a triumphant king as David reigned. And concerning this Messiah ben Joseph, Rabbi Alshech, who I've already referred to, he wrote, this is actually a commentary on Zechariah chapter 12, but it does relate to Isaiah. Uh, For they shall lift up their eyes unto me in perfect repentance when they shall see him whom they have pierced. That is the Messiah, the son of Joseph. For our rabbis of blessed memory have said that he will take upon himself all the guilt of Israel and then shall be slain in the war to make an atonement in such manner that it shall be accounted as if Israel had pierced him. For on account of his sin, he has died. On account of their sin, he has died. Therefore, in order that it may be reckoned to them as a perfect atonement, they will repent and look on the blessed one, saying that there is none beside him to forgive those that mourn on account of him who died for our sin. This is the meaning of, they shall look upon me. Uh, so this is a view that there are actually two messiahs, one who comes to suffer uh, and die and be exalted, and one who comes to reign. Uh, the alternative view which uh, we hold here actually is that there are two portraits of the Messiah, two roles of the Messiah fulfilled actually in two comings of the same person, Yeshua, the Messiah, who came the first time to suffer, to die as an atonement for the sin of the world, who is coming again in power and glory to reign as the reigning king Messiah. And if we go to the New Testament, we find that Yeshua is portrayed as the one who fulfills this prophecy of Isaiah 53. Uh, There are a number of references in Matthew chapter 8, verse 17. It refers to Jesus as the one who would bear our infirmities relating to Isaiah 53. John chapter 12 refers to this passage as relating to Jesus. Acts chapter 1 
And in particular, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 21 to 25. I'll actually read those, 1 Peter 2, 21 to 25. After this you were called because Messiah also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return, when he suffered he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that having died to sins, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed." For you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So here we have passages which relate to Isaiah 53 in the New Testament and relate it to Jesus as the fulfillment of these these prophecies. Um, Jesus himself explained to his disciples that he was going to go up to Jerusalem to suffer, to die, uh, and to rise again from the dead. Matthew 16, from that time Jesus began to show the disciples he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Uh, He also said he was going to come again, and he'd come again in power and glory to judge the world in righteousness. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Uh, That itself is a a reference to the prophecy of Daniel chapter 7. Uh, concerning the second coming of the Messiah. So that leaves us with a question, if Rashi is right, when he says Isaiah 53 is a prophecy about Israel suffering for the Gentiles, um, we would have to discount what the New Testament says about Yeshua. But if uh, those rabbis who claim that this is about the sufferings of the Messiah are wrong, then we would have to say that uh, they're wrong to say it's not about Jesus, but they're right to say that Isaiah 53 is about the sufferings of the Messiah. And if you examine the text, you find that uh, really Rash's interpretation that it's about Israel has a lot of holes in it. Um, First of all, the servant in Isaiah 53 is depicted as being righteous, uh, yet lowly and afflicted and rejected. Uh, Is it true that the scriptures tell you that Israel was a righteous nation? Did Isaiah say Israel was righteous? Did the prophets say Israel was righteous? Uh, Actually, the prophets were continually calling Israel to repent from their sins. That's not to say that Israel is unrighteous and that we are righteous if we're not from Israel. In fact, all nations are unrighteous in the sight of the Lord. Uh, But Isaiah says in the beginning of his book, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 4, Alas, sinful nation, the people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors, they've forsaken the Lord, they've provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. So Isaiah says that Israel needs to repent of their unrighteousness. So how can Israel be the righteous servant of the Lord? Uh, in fact, in the Torah, you read that if Israel is, the right, is living righteously before the Lord, then they will not be suffering and afflicted. They'll be raised up and exalted. And God will defend them from their enemies, and they won't suffer uh, the afflictions of Gentiles coming against them. Uh, but if they are unrighteous, then God will allow judgment to come upon them. That's what we read in Leviticus 6, 26 and uh, Deuteronomy 28. Uh, in the passage in Isaiah, we read that the servant wasn't afflicted because of his guilt, but because of the guilt of others. The servant wasn't guilty. Others transgressed and went astray. Not the servant. He bore the sins of others. So this can't be describing Israel has gone astray. Now I put here that uh, if, if Isaiah 53 is about Israel suffering for the Gentiles, then there are one or two conclusions you have to make from this. First one is that Isaiah was a Gentile. Um, because uh, it says... He, Israel, was wounded for our Gentile transgressions. We Gentiles have gone astray, like sheep have gone astray. The Lord has laid on him, Israel, the iniquity of us all. And you see that that means Isaiah has to be a Gentile if Israel is, uh, if this prophecy is about Israel. Uh, So was Isaiah written, Isaiah 53, written by a Gentile? Um, Actually, there is one interpretation which uh, you'll find in uh, Jewish circles, which is that this was... Uh, the words of Isaiah 52, 12 to the end of the chapter actually are about Israel as a servant. And the words of Isaiah 53 are the words of the kings of the nations. Because if you go back to uh, Isaiah 52, it says that uh, the kings are going to shut their mouths before him. So it's uh, said that Isaiah 53 then is the words of these Gentile kings who are repentant at uh, Israel and Uh, They turn to 
the Lord through Israel's witness. So in that case, uh, one interpretation is saying actually Isaiah 53 is the words of Gentile kings uh, looking at Israel as the servant. Uh, that's an interpretation which uh, some of the rabbis will put forward. It actually doesn't add up because uh, if you look through the scriptures, you'll find that um, the sufferings of the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 53 bring healing to those for whom they suffered, whereas although Israel was smitten by their enemies and continues to be smitten by enemies coming against them, that doesn't bring salvation to those enemies. In fact, uh, God subsequently judges these enemies for uh, overdoing the punishment and for inflicting suffering upon Israel. Uh, Israel's sufferings brought judgment on Assyria, on Babylon, on Greece, and on Rome, not redemption to them. Uh, Israel actually suffers because of the sins of the Gentiles, not on behalf of the Gentiles. Uh, Gentiles who reject the true understanding of God and the Messiah have often persecuted Jewish people. Uh, That doesn't do any good to the Gentiles. It actually puts them under the curse of God, according to Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where it says, I will bless them that bless you and curse him that curses you. Uh, There's no way actually that anti-Semitism brings any good upon those responsible. But if you look in Isaiah 53, the servant of the Lord uh, offers justification and healing even to those responsible for his suffering, uh, provided they turn to him and that he may bear their iniquities. And finally, I put here that Israel, the Jewish people, will cease to live. The servant of Isaiah 53 was literally put to death. He was cut off from the land of the living. Now, individual Jewish people have been put to death by anti-Semites down through the history of the world. And this is one reason why some would say this is about Israel's suffering, uh, because of the sufferings of the Jewish people. But the text here actually says that they're going to be put to death. In other words, they're going to die en masse, the end of the Jewish people. And although there have been those who sought to eliminate the Jewish people, like Hitler and others in the Holocaust, uh, I'm Israel high. The people of Israel live. Uh, Israel will remain a people according to the scriptures as long as the sun and the moon and the stars are shining in the sky. So Israel uh, would not be put to an end. So those are a few uh, objections to Rashi's point of view. Uh, Let's see now what uh, prophecy does say and how it does refer to Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. So if you look to Isaiah 53, if you look at the text of Isaiah 53, you'll find it has... And I talk about Isaiah 53, because of the chapter divisions, it divides at Isaiah 52, verse 13, uh, which is probably not the most inspired chapter division, because this passage from 52, 13 through to the end of chapter 53 is the whole picture of the suffering servant. Uh, In that section, there are actually 15 verses, and they divide really into five sections of three verses, and in each section of three verses, it tells you something significant about the Messiah. Uh, first of all, Isaiah 52, 13 to 15, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations, kings shall shut their mouths at him, for it had not been told them, they shall see what they had not heard, they shall consider. Uh, So these verses really introduce the servant who is described in detail in the verses that follow. They tell you that the servant is going to be exalted very high and prior to his exaltation he's going to be humiliated and physically abused to the point where he becomes almost unrecognizable. So did that happen to Jesus? You look in the New Testament, uh, the description you have in the crucifixion account is brief but it's very graphic. Uh, And it tells you that these things were going to happen to Jesus the Messiah. Uh, Mark chapter 15 and verse 15. Mark 15 verse 15. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him away to the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison, and they clothed him with purple. They twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him, and bowing the knee, they worshipped him. When they mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. They gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. 
When they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Uh, anyone going through this level of physical abuse and humiliation would become almost unrecognizable, as Isaiah prophesied. Yet despite his humiliation, he was going to be raised to life again and ascend to the highest place, just as Isaiah said he would. And if you go on to the book of Acts, you'll find that Peter explains this on his speech on the day of Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus the Messiah. Uh, First of all, Peter relates what has happened to Jesus, how he was put to death and uh, raised from the dead, quotes from the Psalms, Psalm 19, where he says, You will not leave my soul in hell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day, therefore being a prophet, knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to his flesh, he would raise up the Messiah to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah, that his soul was not left in Sheol, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven's, But he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus both Lord and Messiah. So Jesus would be put to death, would then be raised up and exalted to the highest place. Isaiah also speaks about uh, the servant sprinkling many nations. Um, The word which is used for sprinkle in the text in Isaiah is the word nazar. Uh, Nazar is used also in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 6, and 17 to 19 of the priests sprinkling the blood of the sin offering on the sanctuary. In Leviticus 16, in the passage which deals with the Day of Atonement, the day when uh, the high priest would go into the holy place and offer the sacrifice in the holy place, it speaks about him sprinkling the blood of the offering on the mercy seat in the tabernacle, to cleanse and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Uh, So in Leviticus, the word sprinkle is used to uh, speak about the blood of atonement being put upon the holy place. And I think it's no coincidence that Isaiah uses that same word. And in the book of Hebrews, which is a commentary really on Leviticus in the light of Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, uh, he uses the same word, speaking about the blood of Jesus, which was shed for the sacrifice for sins. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 11 with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh how much more shall the blood of Messiah who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God and the letter of John it says the blood of Jesus the Messiah his son cleanses us from all sin. We go on to the next section, Isaiah 53, verse 1 to 3. Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. When we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Uh, These verses speak about the rejection which would accompany the ministry of this servant. His message would not be believed. His origin and appearance would not meet the expectation of the people. Therefore, they would reject him. This rejection would cause him grief. Uh, The New Testament records many reasons why Jesus was rejected through the time of his public ministry. Uh, For precisely these reasons, there was a division between those who would believe and those who rejected So uh, another objection which I came across through Isaiah 53 being about Jesus was uh, one said, well, actually Jesus had great crowds of people following him. So he wasn't rejected. Well, he did have followers and he had many followers. Uh, Sometimes you find that great crowds of people followed him, then he made a hard saying and they stopped following him. Uh, They weren't always with him. And he did experience rejection even at times when he was preaching to great multitudes of people uh, and he experienced rejection uh, throughout his ministry. 
Uh, in John chapter 7, we read how he was rejected by those who said that uh, he couldn't be the Messiah because he came from Nazareth and the Messiah was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. It's almost quite amusing to read that passage because Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But that's the reason why they say that uh, Messiah, he couldn't be Messiah. We find he was rejected by his own family and the people who he'd grown up with who said of him, isn't this the carpenter's son? What's he think he's doing? He's getting it above himself. Um, he was rejected by religious leaders who rejected to the miracles which he did on the Sabbath. Uh, he was rejected by his association because of his association with people who they considered to be <coughs> sinners and above all because of his claim to be equal with God. Uh, and we find a reference to this rejection in the New Testament, um, in particular in Matthew chapter 26, verse 65, at his trial, the high priest answered him and said, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, he's spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you've heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, he is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, prophesy to us, Messiah, who is the one who struck you? Uh, he was even rejected at his hour of need by his disciples, who couldn't stay awake to pray with him at the time of his arrest, and they ran away and left him and denied even knowing him. And on the cross, he experienced even rejection from the Father as the sins of the world were placed upon him. That was why Jesus quoted the words from the psalm, Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment when the sin of the world was placed upon him. Also by quoting Isaiah, by quoting Psalm 22, Jesus was actually referring to that psalm and saying to the people, look, this is what's happening. Psalm 22 is being fulfilled before your eyes. Uh, I am the Messiah who is suffering for you, suffering uh, death on your behalf and having my hands and my feet pierced, as it says in Isaiah in Psalm 22, in order that you might be redeemed through the blood that I shed for you. In all of this, Jesus experienced grief, just as Isaiah said the servant would. In the passage concerning the, uh, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says, he took with him Peter and the sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he said to them, my soul is extremely sorrowful even unto death. Uh, he was about to suffer the pain of flogging, crucifixion, humiliation, and worst of all, having the sin of the world placed upon him. So what Isaiah says concerning the Messiah here in Isaiah 53, about him being despised, rejected by man, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, that would be the experience of Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. We go on to Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6, which are at the center of this passage. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we have seemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, by his stripes we are healed, or well, we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Uh, here it says how the Messiah was going to bear the griefs and the sorrows of the people, he was going to be smitten and afflicted, and he wounded for our transgressions, he was going to bear the sins of the world upon himself, and the chastisement of our peace, the thing that robs us of peace was going to be placed upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Uh, he would experience uh, the worst of sorrows which uh, could be, anyone could throw at him. And yet he would be carrying our griefs as he went through that suffering. And it says, the Lord has placed on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53 verse 6 uh, actually tells us about the human condition. Or we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Are the words which the New Testament agrees with. It tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone has fallen short of what God requires. We've all gone astray. We've all turned to our own way. There's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, we all have a problem of sin which relates to God. Uh, even if we think we're good and religious, it doesn't add up to what God requires. None of us makes the grade as far as God is concerned. We all fall short of his glory. If we all fall short of his glory, if we have all sinned and turned away, uh, what has the Lord done? The Lord has laid on him, on the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. Here it tells us how the Messiah was going to bear the sins of many, going to bear the sins of those who would call upon his name. Uh, so the sin of the world was placed upon Messiah. 
New Testament tells us this. Already read this, but let's read it again. 1 Peter chapter 3. Messiah also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to those him who judges righteously. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live to righteousness. By whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the sheep, shepherd, and overseer of your souls. Every person who turns to Jesus in sincerity discovers he's able to forgive their sins and give them eternal life. And this is the reason for the death of Jesus, according to the New Testament. Uh, Son of man came to seek and to save the lost. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's move on and look at the next section, Isaiah 53, verse 7 to 9. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. They made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Uh, these verses tell us about the sufferings of the Messiah from a human point of view. Uh, he'd be brought to trial and willingly accept the death sentence which was handed down to him despite its injustice. He'd literally be put to death. And once again it stated that his death would be for the sins of my people. Though he'd be expected to be put in the grave with the wicked, there'd be some intervention of the rich at the point of his death. Uh, first of all, let's look at the trial. It says here... Um, He'd be brought to trial, he'd be led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. If you look at uh, the trial narratives in the New Testament, you find that the trials of Jesus before Caiaphas and Pontius Pilate are both unfair and a denial of Jewish and Roman law. Uh, it says in Matthew, the chief priests and all the elders sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered them, nothing. Then Pilate said, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered them, not a word, so that the governor greatly marveled. Uh, Jesus didn't try to defend himself. He went willingly to the cross. He was led away to the slaughter. He was taken from prison and from judgment. What happened next is very interesting. Verse 9, it says, they made his grave with the wicked. Um, what happened when someone was crucified, uh, obviously it was a very cruel form of execution which caused incredible suffering to those who were put on the cross. The Romans actually used crucifixion as a way to keep people under control and under their authority so that uh, they would hold up the person who had been crucified and put them on the cross and say that this is the example of what happens if you go against uh, Rome and if you do something which is a transgression of our laws. Uh, often they would leave the person on the cross uh, for days uh, as a sign of ghastly uh, signpost, if you like, uh, not to uh, transgress against Rome. Uh, on this occasion uh, in Jerusalem, often they would take down the bodies from the cross and throw them into the Valley of Hinnom, which was uh, outside Jerusalem. It was a kind of like the rubbish pit outside, Rome, uh, outside Jerusalem. Uh, Gay Hinnom, it is called in Hebrew. Uh, which translates into Greek as Gehenna, from which actually we have the word in the New Testament for hell, a place where they would throw the bodies. And in the normal course of events, uh, the body of Jesus would have been taken down from the cross and thrown into that pit, along with all of the other uh, people who were executed, and it would be just one corpse among many. Uh, we know from the New Testament that that wasn't what was happened. Uh, if you go to Matthew chapter 27, we find out that there was an intervention from a rich man, and his name was Joseph of Arimathea. Matthew 27 and verse 57. Now in the evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself was also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in a new tomb which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. 
And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. Uh, here's a remarkable fulfillment of prophecy because we have the intervention of a rich man, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, member of the Sanhedrin, who was a disciple of Jesus, who didn't agree with the decision to hand Jesus over to Pontius Pilate, uh, who believed in Jesus, and who wanted to give him some honor, at least in his death, in his burial, and take him from the cross and put him into his own sealed tomb. So instead of being thrown onto that rubbish pit in Gehinom, he was taken and put into a rich man's tomb, and the tomb had a great stone which was rolled over it. Uh, what difference does that make to what happened next? <laughs> Quite a lot, doesn't it? Because yeah. as he was put into that tomb, so he would lie there uh, until the third day when the uh, stone would be rolled away and Jesus would burst out of the tomb uh, as he was resurrected. And that little detail in Isaiah, perhaps Isaiah wondered what he was talking about here when he put about the rich man, actually had a great significance when you come to the New Testament and the fulfillment of this prophecy in the uh, events which took place uh, following the crucifixion of Jesus the Messiah, that he was put into the rich man's tomb, and from there he would rise again from the dead. And finally we come to Isaiah 53, verse 10. Now it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Uh, this reinforces the point which is made three times in this passage, that the servant was going to be put to death, literally to die. Also that he was going to bear the sin of others, going to bear the sin of many tells us also something interesting because it says that uh, something about the purpose of the servant's death. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Uh, the first thing it tells us here is that the putting to death of the servant was actually in the will of God. Uh, so this really tells us who was responsible for the death of Jesus. Go to the New Testament, you find that Jesus himself says that no one takes my life from it. I lay it down of my own accord. Uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 4, we have a definitive verse which tells you who was responsible for the death of Jesus. In Acts, chapter 4, verse 25, it says, By the mouth of your servant David you have said, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth took their stand, the rulers have gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For truly your servant, your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your will to purpose determined before to be done. So that tells you who is responsible for the death of Jesus. It tells you that uh, Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles were gathered together and the people of Israel. So the Jews are responsible and the Gentiles are responsible. So if anyone says the Jews killed Jesus... Yes, there were Jewish people who were calling for the death of Jesus. There were Gentiles who actually carried it out. Uh, but that was in the will of God because it tells you then to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So it was in the will of God. It was God's will that Jesus should die for the sin of the world. Which is what Isaiah tells us. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Uh, Jesus came for that purpose in order to be bruised, to die for our sins, to take the punishment for the sin of the world. Uh, in fact, if you want to really go the whole way, you killed Jesus and I killed Jesus because he died for our sins. We're all responsible. But it was the will of God and it was his own will because he voluntarily gave himself in order to redeem us through his blood to die for us. He made his soul an offering for sin. Uh, that was what he did. He offered his life for the sin of the world. Then it says, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. Now, the prophecy has been telling us over and over again that this servant is going to be dead. He's going to be put to death. So if he's dead, how can he see his seed and prolong his days? Uh, there's one way he could do that. That's if he is resurrected from the dead. So though Isaiah 53 doesn't directly say uh, the servant is going to be resurrected from the dead, the clear implication is that he's going to be put to death. Then he's going to see his seed and prolong his days. Uh, Jesus died and rose from the dead. 
so he can see his seed. Uh, now this raises another objection which uh, you'll find out in some rabbinic writings. They will say that uh, Jesus, uh, this can't apply to Jesus because he didn't have any children. Uh, so the word zerah means seed. Uh, in Hebrew it's yireh zerah. So they say he would see his seed, that means he must see his children. Jesus didn't have any physical seed children, so it can't apply to Jesus. Now that's a bit of a flippant, uh, uh, really, criticism, because the word zerah can also apply to a seed, which is a symbolic seed, if you like. Isaiah's actually spoken about uh, people who are a seed of evildoers. Uh, and here, the seed actually doesn't mean a physical seed, it means a spiritual seed. There'd be those who would be born again as a result of believing in Jesus the Messiah and become children of God. And he's going to see his seed and be satisfied. Uh, so who would the seed of the Messiah be? Those who believe in Jesus. Those who are born again and receive him as the Messiah. And he will see them and be satisfied. Why is he going to be satisfied when he sees them? Because when he sees those who believe in Jesus, he will be satisfied because it was worth it. Even all that pain, that suffering, that agony that he went through for you and me was worth it because he paid the price for the sin of the world. And he can see now... Uh, those who have believed in him who are his seed and be satisfied. And because Jesus is resurrected from the dead, he prolongs his days. In fact, his days will be forever and ever. He came from eternity to this earth. He was an eternal person who paid the price for sin of the world. He rose from the dead. He is now exalted to the right hand of the Father and he is going to be there forever and ever. He's going to return to this earth in person and he's going to rule on the earth for a thousand years during the millennial kingdom. But he's going to be forever. He's going to see his seed and prolong his days. So this prophecy says not only he's going to be resurrected, he's going to prolong his days uh, into the eternal realm. Uh, and because by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. So by the knowledge of the Messiah, he's going to justify many who would believe in him. It doesn't say there he's going to justify all, by the way. So there has to be a choice which people make to believe in Jesus in order to be justified. You're not justified just because Jesus died on the cross. You're justified when you believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead. That means that you have to personally commit your life to Yeshua, Jesus as Savior and Lord, uh, in order to receive the salvation which he has given to us. But if you have made that step, you are justified as far as God is concerned. You're put right with God and you have eternal life your sins are forgiven, and you can know God personally through Jesus the Messiah. Because he's born, there are iniquities. Uh, what is it that separates us from God? It's our iniquities. If Jesus is without sin, and he bore the sin of the world upon himself, if we repent and believe in him, he bears our iniquities so that we are justified in his sight, and we become the children of God. Uh, therefore, it says he's going to divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, he was numbered with the transgressors. Again, repeating the point that Jesus uh, was numbered with transgressors. He was put on the cross with transgressors. He was considered to be a uh, guilty in the eyes of the Sanhedrin and uh, put to death by Roman law uh, and was considered to be a transgressor. Yet he was not a transgressor. He was bearing the sins of others who are transgressors because he bore the sin of many. Uh, and he made intercession for the transgressors. It finally says, Jesus made intercession for transgressors. On the cross, what did Jesus say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh, so, in the letter of Paul to Corinthians, he says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin, or the sin offering for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Uh, Jesus, the Messiah, bore the sin of the world. He fulfilled this prophecy. It's not about Israel suffering on behalf of the nations. It is about the Messiah suffering on behalf of Israel and of the nations, bearing the sins of the world upon himself. And if we believe on the Lord Jesus as our Savior and Lord, we can know that we are children of God, that we are his seed, and that we have eternal life. So, believe on the Lord Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's what I want to say about Isaiah 53. And if you believe in Jesus, you can know that you are saved. And I thank God 
that Jesus was willing to do all of that for me and for you. Because he loved us so much that he was willing to bear our sins on the cross and that through him we can be redeemed from sin and know eternal life. So this wonderful prophecy of Isaiah, written some 750 years before Jesus came, uh, before people even knew about crucifixion as a means of execution, uh, speaks about the suffering of the Messiah. It testifies to the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. It also testifies to the truth that this is the word of God because the prophecies were given by the Holy Spirit to the prophets so that they would reveal things uh, concerning events to come and which will be fulfilled in the events which we have looked at in the coming of Jesus the Messiah. So believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. Praise God. Amen. Let's just have a word of prayer, shall we, as we close. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus the Messiah. We thank you that you came, you were willing to come and to pay the price for the sin of the world. Thank you that you fulfilled these words from the prophet Isaiah and that you rose from the dead and that you're alive today. And Lord, we thank you that we have been born again into your kingdom. Pray that each one here may know the truth and receive you as Savior and be born into your kingdom and so become your children, your seed. We pray that you bless us and keep us and cause your face to shine upon us and grant us your peace through Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. Amen.